Hi, everyone. I would just like to welcome you here to uh, today to our the lecture on collaborative design by Noel Brady. Noel Brady he graduated with a diploma in architecture from DIT and a Bachelor of Architecture of Science from TCD in 1985 before adding a master's in architectural studies from, in MIT in 1989. Returning to Ireland in 1990, he has worked as an architect in practice as well as teaching at what was the School of Architecture, DIT. He added an MBA in 2018 from DIT and is currently enrolled in a PhD programme at TU Dublin. His current role at TU Dublin includes lecturing in architecture design, technology, tier and urbanism at the new School of Architecture, building an environment across the three programmes of B. Architect Honours, Bachelor of Architecture Honours and Master of Architecture. He's also the current chair of the Undergraduate Bachelor of Architecture Honours. So everyone, I'd like to welcome Noel Brady and his presentation. Patrick, thank you very much and good evening, everybody. I hope that you find this uh, particular presentation interesting and certainly um, relevant to your um, challenges that we're all facing today in terms of sustainability. And it is with sustainability I'm going to start tonight's presentation. I'm not so sure if you're familiar with EN 15978, but this is the core legal framework under which sustainability of construction works is actually measured. I'm starting this as establishing the context in which you will hear about our plans and our work in the MR program around collaborative design. This is how sustainability is measured. It sets out calculation method based on life cycle assessments, not our qualified environmental information. It gives a description of the object of assessment, the bound system boundary that applies at the building level, procedure for inventory analysis, indicators and procedures for calculation of those indicators and requirements for presentation of results in reporting and communication and the requirements for data necessary for calculation. This is going to become really important as EU levels, which is coming down the track mandated from 2025 for buildings over a thousand square meters and for all buildings after 2030. The auditing requirements for EU levels is quite onerous. But one of the key elements that we're going to be talking about tonight is going to be about measurement and particularly as a field in which collaboration will take place. Um, the framework for the collaborative, the EN15978 consists of this diagram, which covers five key elements of the building life cycle from A, one through A5, from B1 to B7, C1 to C4, and the off um, section D, which is less referred to, but is fundamental to EU levels, which is about the area beyond the building life cycle for reuse, recovery, recycling potential. So I want to outline a little bit about that, how that relates to the site of collaboration. For those who've worked with architects, you may be familiar with the REI uh, standard um, stage of um, the design process from stage one to stage six. And it is being augmented by REBA's move into stages zero and stage seven. Now, stage seven deals with use or particularly post occupancy analysis, and stage zero is about strategic definition. The REI um, have expanded their stages for the modern methods of construction framework to include these two particular stages. And one would see that the REI standard stages will actually follow suit pretty much soon or rather than later. However, I'm gonna argue, and we'll, this is again, the context in which we're gonna be talking about collaborative design about stages eight and nine, which will be added to this because when we map on EN1, uh, 5978, we find that the elements related particularly to end of life, deconstruction, transport and waste, stages C to C, C1 to C4 and stage D, there are fall within a gap that is not covered by the work stages at the moment. And the reason why I'm setting this context is because all of these elements you'll see in terms of things like transportation, deconstruction, assembly, maintenance, repair, these all have a role to play for collaborative design. 
this is the blue ocean where opportunities lie. The low zero carbon challenges, however, have been well documented, particularly from Gigason, Barrett and Taylor in 2016 have identified that to get low carbon materials into the supply chain has been a significant challenge. In fact, one of the key barriers to this is that construction is highly fragmented, risk-adverse, supplier-driven industry with small workforces with limited research and development. In fact, to summarize, construction firms have small workforces, limited research and development, limited absorptive capacity, limited capacity to assess all aspects of novel materials, limited ability to exploit new technologies, and a heavy dependency on specific human capital. It doesn't mean it can't be done, it just means it is difficult. The right source of processes and incentives in place, according to the chair of the Embodied Carbon Task Force in the UK, said that we can see an amazing amount of innovation. A lot of embedded ways of doing things, there is a lot of inertia at the moment. So if we can combine the right sort of processes and incentives, we will get the innovation necessary. So one of the areas that we decided to focus on, we established our MRC studio in five years ago. And when given the challenge to look particularly at a focus around durable design, I took on a much bigger challenge about uh, setting up a boot camp for architecture students who have completed four years of their architectural education, who have rarely been in contact with any other discipline other than architects, and uh, are dealing with these significant challenges coming down the road. So the context in which the studio operates is very much one that is created of our own environment. And with an eye towards those stages C and D in the um, sustainability framework, the 2018 census gives us an eye to what that looks like. So in terms of non-domestic buildings, the energy rating for buildings between 1900 and 2018 had a BER rating of less than D, 49% of it. If we move the dial up to 2005, 2018, that doesn't improve that much, it's only 41%. That's a large amount of product and um, deployed resources that is significantly underwater when it comes to energy efficiency and capability. It also is the, essentially the quarry from which we will mine our opportunities going forward in terms of a collaborative studio. So one of the key things that we were very keen to do was to establish or empower change through our students. And subsequent to our establishment of the MRC, we are now working collaboratively with the other five schools of architecture in Ireland on a building change project, which is about resetting the curriculum to deal with the climate emergency and the UN SDGs. I'm doing a slight segue here to Don Norman, who's the character on the right-hand side. So Don Norman is a very well-established critic and um, reviewer of urban environments and product design, particularly when it doesn't really function that well. But he came up with these guides in terms of dealing with the future, in terms of what designers need to take on board. And one of the key things that we take to heart, certainly in a club design studio, a thing that architects are less acquainted with is this issue of numbers and learning to know the numbers to be able to affect change. You need to be at the table. You need to know how to actually deal with the real data that's going on around you. They also need empathy in terms of users, but I'm expanding that to actually include empathy, particularly with our colleagues in the other disciplines. It is not certainly not <clears throat> uh, well um, regarded that architects tend to find that they're happy in their own silo and trying to work collaboratively is it's often a challenge. Also, uh, the problems that we are faced with aren't just measurable problems of quantitative components. There are qualitative elements that we will need to deal with uh, redesigning our environment. And of course, in really to have an impact, you need to start working with the big boys and actually learn to advocate and uh, action and those ideas. The other key element that taken from Don is the idea that we need to look at the externalities, the unintended consequence of these decisions. In fact, decision-making is one of our core disciplines as part of Collaborative Design Studio. And the other part of it is that we can't have weird solutions. We need to um, be clear that we need to fit. We need to fit it within systems that already exist, but also other systems that um, we are not necessarily authors of. 
So the future remains to be discovered. We're very much set up our MRC with the idea that they're hacking the future and that they're going forward. So where does the Collaborative Design Studio fit? So in our five-year program, our undergraduate program, which is a long linear uh, iterative process leading to professional practice after a period of um, postgraduate experience and the post-professional diploma in architectural practice, that's pretty much an established career path that's been with us for the best part of 50 years, odd years. The MRC sits here. So our students exit after fourth year, deciding that they want to either find a different route forward, usually towards more research um, and possibly a PhD pathway, but they have an opportunity to return back into the professional network in the same fashion as our undergraduates. What fits here is the um, Architecture, Culture, Whole Life Design, Collaborative Design Studio sits in the first semester of this three semester MR program. And I'm responsible for the Whole Life Design and Collaborative Design Studio components. So why this is relevant to remind us of the framework of the EN 15978, this is the blue ocean that we're going to mine. And we're conscious of the extent it, building stock that is either neither fit for purpose or certainly not fit for the future purpose. And we need to re-interrogate what that actually might mean. And so I'm reminded of Trigger's Broom. Anyone who's ever seen Only Fools and Horses might remember this particular episode. Trigger, the character on the right, has just received a medal from his local council for using the same broom for 20 years. And he's asked, you know, has he ever used a broom to sweep any roads because it looks perfect? He says, of course, but he looks after it well. And he goes on to explain that his broom has had 70 new heads and 40 new handles. Of course, this is a concept that Douglas Adams has um, recounted in his explication of the Gold Pavilion in, uh, Temple in Kyoto, where he realizes that it's not the original building, in fact, has been burnt down many times with completely new materials. But of course, the curator of the building says it's still the same building, it is the exact same building. And he had to admit to himself that at a perfectly rational point of view, the idea of a building, the intention of it is its design are all immutable and the essence of the building. To be overly concerned with the original materials, which are merely sentimental souvenirs of the past, is to fail to see the living building itself. So how do we support this collaborative design um, environment? Well, the students can't do this in absentee. They can't be just dumped into a studio environment to actually start working or playing in this field. So we actually build a theoretical framework that actually supports that with a view towards that integrated a sustainability thing. We introduced them to the role of data, flexibility and adaptability of typologies, post occupancy analysis, embodied carbon, operational carbon, shearing layers, durability studies, and Bream and LEED uh, accreditation. And these are the type of drawings the students do based on an actual case study. And what they're doing with these case studies is actually tearing them apart in the way so that they can almost reverse engineer in the case study so they can apply the principles then to their combined collaborative design studio. So the concept of our studio is based on, to some degree, on Thomas Kuhn's um, revolutionary theory about, um, sorry, scientific revolutions and how they've come about, leading to an analysis of how ideas um, start to move from the status quo to a drift crisis, revolution, and then paradigm change. And what we do is artificially construct to some degree an understanding of what that might look like. So the Thomas Kuhn's revolution cycles were transferred into S-curves life cycles in terms of product um, development and business development. But what we use then is a similar cyclical process where we interrogate a project that the students work in groups as collaborators, and they have uh, the benefit of working through a scaffolded phased system to allow them to interrogate a project and extend project with a new output and using an external design team, which involves an architect, QS engineer and environmental services engineer to act as critical friends at various stages in those phased uh, presentations. Our original plan for the Collaborative Design Studio was to invoke a design team in the studio. 
and it would be a rotational design team where the students would, in the form of Edward the Bono's multiple hats um, theory, is that they would take on the role of the engineer or the QS or the mechanical engineer and would inhabit that domain and at least then grow to be empathetic towards the demands and requirements or the disciplines around that, around the singular project. We tried to make this project as authentic as possible. It's a real building that they had to interrogate a different use. And it has a very interesting test, which we'll come to later. But in the end, we a suggestion from our head of school said that we could get a design team to act as the critical friend and then thus free up the students to actually act in a sense in the roles necessary. So the scaffolding piece, the phases A, B, C, and D are designed around spatial, structural services engineering, and they have to inhabit the roles and responsibilities of each of those phases accordingly. As I said, it's supported by the theoretical a framework of whole life design. And it comes from the idea of a very radical view in terms of whole life costing, that writing down guesses doesn't help and spending several years writing down very detailed guesses only increases the likelihood that the building will be obsolete when it opens. Now that actually echoes Stuart Brand's analysis that all buildings are predictions and all predictions are wrong. So we try to get as much um, adaptability into our thinking right from the start. We get them to think uh, in a very generous way to all of those co-designers that work with us in our buildings, giving space for engineering, giving space for uh, all the technological elements that are needed to support a highly adaptive future that we expect. And of course, the Stuart Brand says the building is not something you finish, it's something that you start. We argue that the architecture is a dynamic living system that lives and breathes in a changing modes and mores. And uh, very much central to that is obviously Brand's analysis that he took from Francis Duffy at DGW about shearing layers, about how we accommodate change and how we accommodate elements. The key elements that the reason for the very highly scaffolded system is that when provided with external supporting tools, structures, and real-time guidance, students can be helped to succeed in cognitive process that otherwise impossible. And as we rapidly, and the reason we call it a boot camp is that it rapidly goes through these phases. This is all executed within a 12-week taught structure. It's 15 weeks in total for the semester, but in 12 weeks, we go through quite a big demand phase from A through to E. You note here that phase E is called change order. And this is designed specifically to test the theories the students have employed to see whether or not their building can be proven to be as adaptable as they imagined right from the start. They're not given the change order. In other words, the building types that we normally use from offices, we change them to a school, for instance, in the last semester. And then from there, we go to a nursing Home, but they hadn't any idea that that was going to be the final use pattern that they were expected to use. This gives you an idea of the week structure. You can see that the phases are listed on the left and the various component pieces, the people of the design team that infer or import their knowledge into the system is shown on the right-hand side. So we have, again, we have the architect at the start, the structure engineer comes on board regarding the structure, the M&E engineers come on board when we start talking about systems, and then the QS starts talking about durability and cost analysis, cost benefit analysis. And then at the latter part of the design phases, we actually have full team um, component inputs from on the durability cost benefit piece and then on the final presentation critical feedback. It's very important when we're building this um, collaborative design studio that is a safe space that is designed to allow for failure and fail rapidly so that we can actually learn from that. Each phase is fully critically engaged with by the design team to actually help the students refocus um, their energies and to essentially be a calibration in real terms against what happens in practice. The students are introduced, therefore, to a wide range of technical, tactical design skills, effective spatial planning, efficiency planning, typological research, sharing their analysis, embodied and operation energy calculations, modular design, servant space allocation, and hybrid construction. And this model then is wrapped in a, a system of continuous feedback loops. And again, this echoes Kuhn's scientific revolution diagram. 
the shearing layers is mapped. You can see here how they're mapped in terms of the um, overall structure. Uh, the site obviously is unchanging. It sits there regardless of what we do. And that obviously has impact in terms of phases A and E. But as we move through structure, we have the foundation load bearing elements that remains pretty much static. But then we expect that they design towards the idea of repair renewal. And this again is quite unique among architecture schools, the idea that our students will do a durability analysis on a repair renewable strategy, including costing, what that actually looks like, and that they build in that thinking as part of their design approaches. So what we're getting is really a, a more an integrated design student, uh, somebody who actually can cover all of the bases. Now, that all seems very abstract in terms of what I'm explaining. So it's better probably to actually show you some of the examples of the type of work that the students then output as a consequence. So the vehicle um, is picked in cohort with the external design team, usually a project that they have worked on in some shape or form. So we have quite a lot of data to begin with. It's an existing, usually commercial building that requires a renewal or upgrade. And we have a quite a wide opening brief. We tend not to specifically give them a sort of performance criteria in terms of numbers of rooms or areas of floors. Instead, we give them a, a use categorization. So this last year, we gave them a school that had a primary school, sorry, Montessori primary and secondary school on the same campus. And previously, we've given people like in the case of this uh, social um, uh, office, uh, we gave them a requirement to build a boutique hotel. And in the one on the left, we gave them a office air rights project over the um, market building. We didn't again define the limits or the envelope of the development or the performance key component. And so we've taken on a number of different office buildings. And this is part of that 41% of buildings that are low performing that need to be upgraded. They also need different uh, light um, uh, use categorization. So 2019, when we started, was the market building. 2020, the boutique hotel. 21, we had an adaptive reuse to residential. And then 22, to an urban university. And then the pivots that were designed to test the um, design decisions that students made from market to leisure gym, from hotel down to a step down medical facility from uh, a residential building to social use like library and clinic and then an urban university to an r d laboratory extension now one of the key things i mentioned this issue of design processes so design is built upon decisions and most mechanical engineering and other engineering based um, decision making process are usually waterfall methodology in other words that if you can define the brief significantly um, clear enough in the first instance, then it's just a matter of deductive reasoning to actually get down to a final solution. However, what then tends to happen is that you get a um, composition, a product that actually is no greater than the sum of its parts. And we see that when that is brought to market in form of cars, airplanes, and that you actually can have results that are um, unpredictable or actually not very cohesive in terms of that. So we try to not undertake a waterfall methodology. We try to upend that and we'll come to that now shortly. So in the Collaborative Design Studio, we try to keep it open-ended. Um, we, in fact, pretty much is open-ended all the way through each of the phases. In other words, while we start with the requirements of the brief and a design like the spatial design, we keep it loose enough so that when we import the importance of structure, why structure becomes an important defining element, that they need to be open to the idea that the spatial strategy may have to change. Now, traditionally in architectural education, it's usually the design is the important thing, the space is the important thing, the light's important thing, and that structure is relegated to merely support, scaffold, whatever that is, even if it's expensive, costly, um, problematic and the like. In this instance, all inputs are equally valued so that the structure, the role of the structural engineer is as equally important as the mechanical electrical engineer as is the QS that all of them are still live on the table. So this is akin to spinning plates. 
Um, so it's a really challenging thing for students who expect to be very definitive, have definitive answers, but also be very protective about their uh, design approaches in that. It's also antithetical to the idea of a efficiency program um, delivery, because it means that with this open-ended process, this tree like learning tree, it just means that you're kind of in this fuzzy uh, territory pretty much all the way through the process. However, imagining these this tree, it isn't as complicated as it might seem. Now, what we tend to do is actually be very Catholic in terms of the type of methodologies we use to help them make decisions. So we can use, we use decision matrices, comparison frameworks, and body energy calculations, assembly considerations. It's quite multifaceted. And this, again, is expanding the capability, but also introducing other techniques, such cost balance analysis, that might be used by QS rather than uh, an architect. So this is the building of the empathetic model that the students need to engage more holistically with the people around them to build a community of um, co-conspirators or researchers in that. So we invoke Per's Brave's work. He uses a lot of um, similar stratagems in terms of innovation, discovery of new knowledge, developing real world problems, building a set of parts and accessing a community of people to render the problem tangible. And that scene breaking sort of process of breaking down the students what they've currently come from after four years of indoctrination to quite a different sort of element of prototyping, testing, uh, analysis of community building and the like. So these prototyping tactics, and you'll see some of the ones that we have available. So while the specific activities might seem like some path analysis, case study analysis, desire lines, pathways, you'll see on the far right on that we have quite a number of very ad hoc um, drawings, techniques, um, devices used to essentially ask better questions. And we constantly refer to this as being an interrogation process rather than one that's trying to find solutions. And to try and avoid the solution first problem, which is, you know, once I got the solution, then, you know, to trying to find the problem that it fits to rather than find the problem first and really derive an appropriate um, solution. So each of the phases have very particular um, prototypes that go with that, and they're not the standard idea that a prototype is somehow a test of a final physical thing. It's actually a series of interrogations that will help move this forward. So within 12 weeks, we cover a lot of ground with the students. Um, they're pretty much shell-shocked by going through this, but it really is uh, a, the importance of building an innovation and even an entrepreneurial sort of approach to how they would normally deal with buildings. And the other thing that we are very keen on not doing is the temptation is to move directly towards presentation. So all presentations that we do, they do online presentations to our design team are very dynamic. They're filled with diagrams and drawings of different quality of different elements. Sometimes they're data led in terms of mathematics and, and matrices. We get them to do uh, embodied, but also operational energy calculations. And we do longhand um, carbon uh, calculation using the BAT ICE database to actually establish you know, what is the actual performance of the building. Different types of models, we extrapolate different elements in that. We don't look at the whole building. We might look at a part of the building to do test analysis, do comparison testing, for instance, for cost analysis. Where appropriate, we use um, digital techniques in that in terms of lighting in that for helping make decisions. Um, and the construction particularly piece is very, very important. So from the outside, this often looks like a very, very technical design studio. And there's a lot of very explicitness about the nature of how they express their work and their drawings. Um, but it's very varied in terms of how they um, interrogate the work and what uh, materials they bring to bear. With the design teams, they, there are four person um, student groups. They have full authorship of the actual program, the brief and everything else. They're fully in control of the values that they bring to bear on the actual project. Um, each of the phases is led by different students. So there's a student that leads a spatial, there's a different student that leads a structure. So then they take ownership of the demands and the outputs required of all of these things. So this is all done within the 12 week um, scenario. 
Um, it's highly complex, lots of different sort of material. But one of the things we found in developing uh, these ideas is that while there is a significant quantitative piece to the overall studio, that the qualitative um, is really, really important and that the quantitative must be in the service of the qualitative. And as we go towards answering these key critical questions about low carbon, about sustainability and that, that it can actually very quickly look like it's just a purely numbers game. And we're very keen that this, is, this isn't just about measurement, it's about measuring not just what matters, but actually the other non-measurable things, the qualitative elements that we can actually provide for things like the interstitial. So they, we spend a bit of time towards the end, particularly about you know a reflective part of their process and how they see the role in which they've um, the architect plays, but also particularly in terms of collaborative design, how they providing space for those other people who are actually contributing to these solutions can actually provide a new map to the future. So this is one of the reflective process one of our students did at the very end of the process. And this documents all the key elements of that input into their final project. Um, and it, you can see it's quite a, a, a very dense, very wide ranging sort of um, a series of activities you can start seeing here where it starts with the concept, moving towards spatial organization and all the decisions that were made in relation to that, then the structure that helped supported those decisions, the services that had to be then configured to actually deal with that, the durability piece to actually say, you know, can this actually be built for the longevity in terms of not just this current use, but actually what happens if there's a pivot, what happens then at the end of 60 years, how do we recycle all that? And the phase change is designed specifically to test their own uh, assumptions in that. And then at the final building, they get to reflect and consider um, those prospects. We've written two papers um, on this particular studio. So anyone who's actually interested, um, the first one was um, published in 22 in the Irish Journal of Academic Practice on challenging design, which is a case study on the actual collaborative design and responsible decision-making. And the other one, which is currently with editors at the moment for review for publication I presented in Cardiff last year, is Against Architecture, a Map to the Future. Now that in a sense, while it seems quite um, argumentative against architecture, it really is more or less against the traditional form in which we produce architecture and it's really for architecture but it's for a collaborative architecture and architecture of the future so the future is unknown um rather unknowable but it contains part we recognize from our time from our histories it's made of elements of our culture and practice if architecture survive we must be able to care for it maintain it and repair it and when i presented this as i said uh is is really for architecture, a different form, one brought about by collective action and architecture, much like the ship of thesis, is preserved in its usefulness, its ability to hold its form despite the ravages of time and space, remain meaningful to those who inherit the work. And we can only this through this through collaboration. So our design studio aims to introduce architecture students to this new landscape and provide them with the tools to navigate this new territory and in time lead the shift. So thank you very much for that. I think I managed to get it below the timeline, Patrick. So we've plenty of time for questions. Thank you very much, Noel. Um, I'd just like to um, highlight again the Q&A function to our audience. And <clears throat> if they could type in the, the questions into the, um, the Q&A function, we can read them out for Noel. Uh, Patrick, it's uh, Ali here. I don't know if you can hear me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I had a question for Noel. Firstly, fantastic presentation, Noel, uh, and thank you for preparing it. A huge amount of effort has gone into it. Uh, I think it's EU mandate now that the very first question after any presentation must involve uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I, I'd be keen to understand, having having studied with you for two years uh, and knowing your constant reminders about the robots coming for us, uh, <laughs> I, I, I wonder... Collaboration, obviously, which benefits, I think, from having a, a lot of different minds uh, around and 
testing ideas and testing the project um, with artificial intelligence kicking in, do you think that's going to be a, a benefit, um, a help, or, or will it be a, a hindrance to collaboration? Uh, or will we just see the kind of the human element slowly erode over time uh, as AI is used by, by clients and by, by lead designers to short, short circuit um, certain design processes? Um, good question, Ali. I, I think that certainly there's a great temptation to use AI to do that shortcutting to um, remove, it's supposed to remove cost, you know, and, and often, you know, time is money. And uh, certainly uh, when you look at collaboration, it often leads to much more complex sort of um, situations where people are spending time doing what looks like it's non productive work. Um, the certainly we already seen in in architectural circles the uh, use of AI, particularly when it comes to things like efficiency planning, um, and particularly in large scale urban developments where you've got lots of housing or repetitive elements, and there is a great temptation just to say actually well if I can get AI to do it, I don't need a design team. The thing that we and and one of the other aspects certainly as we're dealing with sustainability. You know, the underlying sustainability is use less, you know, be more efficient, you know, be more effective. And there is a real uh, sense that this could lead to quite a reductive um, response from a design perspective. And of course, AI would be very effective in doing that. The contrarian argument is, however, as we've gone through a lot of this, if we're dealing with um, the key questions about durability and long term adaptability, what we're seeing is a real need to include for a lot more generosity. So for instance, one of the key tests that we actually get our students to do is firstly understand typologies, how they work, where they've come from, you know, why are certain dimensions occur either from an efficiency point of view or from a structural eff effectiveness point of view. But then, you know, where the margins are in terms of what changes you can make to make it a billing truly um, multi-variable. You know, so for instance, the standards for housing design versus hotel design to clinics or ward design, there's not a lot of difference, but it's considerable if you get it wrong. You know, if you design towards the minimum for certain residential developments, it can't easily pivot to another use. So that's generosity. That's a kind of a qualitative piece that I think deserves collaborative design inputs on. And so for instance, things like how we plan services for adaptability and the big discussion at the moment around how do we convert offices to residential? And one of the key elements is of the distribution of vertical services for drainage, for instance, that's a key limiting factor. Now, part of the problem is defining the question because in some cases people are looking at a maximization process where you just basically max out the floor plate and just try to shove in as many residential units you can. But you know, a qualitative piece might be not to maximize the floor plate and find a better solution. Now again, you know, the language sets for AI are getting more sophisticated, again more complex, but I was reading a report recently that the cost of building those language sets is close to a billion, you know, and so there's not a lot of people with that level of capital to be able to say, well, um, I, I'm going to build a language set that will allow me to become efficient in the future. That level of investment just isn't really there. Again, going back to the idea that the contracting uh, environment is fragmented. It's not that cohesive in terms of you don't have one big monolith of a, of a construction firm that's capable of investing that level of money to get the downstream benefits of AI. So long answer to a short question. Um, yes and no. I think it will have a major impact. I think there is going to be a lot of temptation around that. But you know, you don't need AI to is come up with an efficiency plan for mass production. You know, you can easily do that without any input. And if you look to China, there's lots of uh, mass production housing that's really very poor quality that was constructed without AI. So yes, there are dangers. Yes, there are also benefits. Possibly, it depends on where you judiciously uh, apply it. Um, yes, I'm kind of fearful of certain aspects of AI, but possibly more on the more bigger management issues of systems and that, rather than what it's going to do to construction. Yeah, very good. And, and I suspect the 
the uh, resource constraints that we have in the industry at the moment yeah. uh, might be a, a tempting driver to, to push people away from, uh, you know, trying to source international resources yeah. and maybe look at more digital um, uh, opportunities. But um, yeah. Well, on the digital front, certainly, like I've looked at the IGBC have published or at least a beta version of their framework to report on EU levels. So the EU levels requirement on reporting is really quite onerous. And we looked at the possibility of applying it in the studio, but it would take up a considerable amount of time for people to um, you know, deal with the data stream coming from billing. They would also need to know a much higher level of knowledge about what goes into your building. And the only way I can see this actually working is as if you have a fully integrated Revit platform uh, or BIM platform to be able to capture the, the actual data of your building and to be able to process and to report on it. So there will be a major digital component going forward one way or the other, whether AI is involved or not. Super. Thanks, Noel. Uh, Noel, we have a question in here from uh, Shauna Murphy. Uh, can you recommend any built or in-process Irish projects that have used a collaborative design approach or any firms that consider this less traditional approach in their designs? It would be great to look into an established project that utilizes these ideas that are coming into light. Thanks for the presentation, Shauna. Um, we've been working for the last five years with PAC Studio. And the reason we worked with Peter Crowley, we've worked with before Peter worked with me as a teacher for a while and, and he's ex um, Lucas McAvoy. And um, what's been interesting is that we targeted Peter because firstly, that he was very keen on the collaboration. And in fact, we're, we're looking at uh, how this actually develops into the future. But um, we have a, it's kind of a, mixed environment out there um so case it's a kind of a case by case basis because the billing industry is filled with dynamics that aren't perfect uh so even the best collaborative team may not get the best outcome depending on you know you could have a difficult client or a difficult site or you know economic constraints and that the type of ambitions that we're trying to see actually is ahead of where everybody else is because we're looking at trying to design for a future that is multivarious. In other words, that it has different outcomes that we can't predict. So it's more about scenario exercises than actual a singular brief thing. But certainly Peter's work has been very interesting um, because it, the reason why we, as I said, tagged him was that he was interested in this area and has been working with a number of colleagues on a number of projects like these um, to develop systems. So. It's kind of been, he's learning as much as we're learning from him. Um, I think Lucas and I have had some very interesting uh, work done in terms of certainly on the sustainable materials end of things. Um, I can't attest towards their collaborative element. In the last couple of years, we've been essentially creating an ad hoc um, collaborative team. So we have in a number of people from Arabs and other firms that are operating in, in a kind of a, virtual um, design team that helps us as critical friends through the process. Probably not as a, a direct solution to Shauna, but uh, gives some guidance to our thinking. Thanks, Noel. Um, there's another comment in from Owen. Um, Owen says, many thanks, Noel, fascinating. What opportunities arise for new relationships within the academic structures, particularly within TUD, um, Owen Lewis? Oh, okay. Um, opportunities. Um, we're hoping that it, we will grow and develop. At the moment, our cohort of students is 16, so it's quite small. Um, we've only been running for 15 years. It's in a growth mode. Interestingly enough, we've had an increase of interest from Erasmus students who have been joining us and said they've found out what we've been doing because it's unlike anything that's been done elsewhere. Our externs for the MRC, we had um, uh, our, one of our externs who's just uh, retired this year is from SOM in, in New York, and they haven't come across anything like this elsewhere there either. In terms of opportunities, um, certainly one of our, some of our students have taken on the work we've done in the first semester as their master's um, thesis. 
and one or two have actually taken on some of the topics and moved it into a PhD candidatory role. So they're actually taking what we've done and moving it to the next level. In terms of um, our educators, we've kind of a, well, we're always interested, I suppose, to listen and to hear from people who are interested in, in bringing their experiences. So there's obviously opportunities for people to come in and, and give lectures on either one-off basis. We have very tight, we have very difficult controls brought in since the um, financial crisis in terms of hiring and that. So we've kind of a very um, difficult time in trying to get new staff. Um, at the moment, the tradition has been largely to have people with uh, architectural centered degree, but increasingly we've had a number of new um, teachers join us who've had multiple um, disciplinary uh, experiences. So we have one particular person who's working on our team who has a number of degrees, including engineering, architecture, and I think it's digital technologies as well. So it's becoming much more varied in terms of our staffing, um, but there's certainly always an opportunity if people are interested in coming on and, and, and talking to us, certainly by all means, drop me a line. So um, that's all the questions answered on the Q&A. Is there, is there anything else anyone else would, would like to ask, ask before? Just while we're giving people an opportunity there, do, do you know the, the process of, of, of getting students to undertake um, other roles um, when, say, the engineer and become the QS? Have you found any particular preconceptions do you know when they go into that that they find is 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 it do, do you think they learn a lot from from taking on the other roles i suppose as the engineer and how the architect and the engineer work together have you seen anything that's 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 been very evident from from that process that you've done over the last few years so um what we initially had the plan was to have them as as i said take on those roles when we brought in the design team it relieved them of that obligation which was great to some degree but what it didn't relieve them of obligation was the leadership role that they had to take uh, on for that particular phase so if i take the structural phase um one of the students would be elected to take on that and in fact it was rotational so that meant that all the, the four team members had to take on a leadership role for one of the phases A through D. For phase E, they could elect themselves as to which one of those members would take on the lead. So what it provided an opportunity for, aside from their um, need for them to guide and help the team through that particular phase, let's say structure, so they had particular briefing um, targets that they needed to keep an eye on. It gave me an opportunity to build another layer to the system. So we use a servant leadership model for the leadership role. And I work with each of the team leaders uh, on that and what's expected of them, what that role actually would look like. And so I haven't had any real resistance. We haven't had resistance to the numerical aspects, the quantitative aspects of the program. They've all engaged and even those that would not, not normally lend themselves to the technical end of things, have embraced all of these things. Um, there's been, I think the real benefit has been the empathetic improvement uh, in terms of their understanding of the role the architect plays within a team rather than one as a dictator dictatorial position. Um, so it's all been good, um, Patrick. And we haven't had seen any particular downside. Um, Patrick, maybe just, just an extension, Patrick, on, on that question. Um, has has uh, has anybody role played either the client or the customer in in that setup? So the the customer might be one of the many different users, maybe somebody in a wheelchair, maybe somebody who's who's blind. The client might be somebody who maybe they're not a big multinational corporation, so budgets are very very important. Has has that ever been a, a kind of a thought? Um, it has been a, a thought. What we've um, advocated for is that the, the external design team will take on some of those roles. So, for instance, the architect, in this case, Peter Crowley, would actually take on a kind of a client representational role based on his experience with the actual real client or a hypothetical client constructed from his experiences. But yes, it's a very interesting one. And it has become probably more interesting in terms of the final pivot, the final phase where they have to show 
um, the qualitative aspects of that. So we tend to, as reviewers in that, we'll tend to take on a critical role in terms of trying to represent the, the um, unvoiced or, or the unrepresentative uh, elements of that. Um, I suppose a key thing, Ali, is that one of the aspects of this particular studio is that it's in some way more universal and more generic. So because we're advocating for adaptive reuse and long-term durability issues, we have tend to neutralize some of the more very specific, you know, very pointed clientele issues that might exist on some briefs. Yeah, very good. Uh, just, just very quickly, uh, just, just on this, I, I, it's why I find this presentation as interesting as, as it is. Uh, that that I've I've kind of been a part of, of two separate bus interchange schemes in my life. The very first one we designed, uh, I was I can put my hand up and say that I was incredibly ignorant because I I had my engineering hat on, <clears throat> and everything I was looking at was can I make it achieve a standard? Can I meet the requirements? Uh, and uh, thankfully that was just a concept design. Um, <laughs> because I think about a year later I was involved with another bus interchange scheme is in New Zealand, uh, and. Thankfully for the client, there was a transport planner who was involved and in charge uh, because the very first thing they had said was, okay, forget engineering, forget architecture, uh, forget absolutely everything. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to list down all of the customers who are going to use this product at the end. Um, and I, I was figuring as an engineer, there'd be about three, four customers. Uh, by the end of that workshop, I think we had identified 30, maybe 40 customers. You know, you you had the person who who was working in the train station selling flowers. You had somebody who was a taxi driver. You had somebody who was a cyclist coming into the station, and then a separate customer, a cyclist leaving the station. Uh, and it it really challenged everybody to think about everybody's individual needs going in and out of the station, uh, which I think is is kind of uh, kind of akin to to what you've been saying. Um, you know, broadly speaking, during the presentation, which I kind of resonated with me uh, pretty well. But I'll leave it there. A fantastic presentation. I'll pass it back to Patrick. Sorry, Patrick, to, to jump Thanks, in. Sally. No problem. Um, so I think you've you've covered all the questions, Noel. So um, I would like to thank uh, you on behalf of the Cork Region of Engineers Ireland for tonight's very interesting and informative presentation. I was surprised at the, the decrease in stock above the rating of D that you highlighted at the start. And while it is disappointing, I suppose in one sense, it does offer a lot of opportunities uh, going forward for engineers. Um, I would like to congratulate you on creating a very important and crucial module of work uh, for your students, which I believe will be very beneficial to them in, 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 the, work in the workplace. Um, as a project manager myself, I found the uh, quote, a building is not something you finish a building is something that you start uh, a very worrying <laughs> one from from my point of view, but uh, uh, I, I can see the, the 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 where you're coming from on that. So so again, Noel, look, thank you very much for giving up your time and presenting a very thought provoking and enlightening overview on collaborative design. So thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you very much to everybody. Thank you, Ali, for inviting me.